Good morning, everyone. Right now, you're probably thinking, where did he go? For those on Zoom, I only see in the slides, there's an empty pulpit right now. I'm not in the auditorium, but you can still hear me. For those that are in the auditorium, you saw me walk in and out, so you know I'm here, but I'm not here in the pulpit. Bear with me, and this should make sense by the end. We as Christians deal with this type of situation every day. We may not realize it, or we forget about it. We tread the duality of being on this earth and being not of this earth. As humans, we have souls. No matter how weird the experience is here on earth, we have to focus on what matters, our eternal destination. How do we reconcile our dualities, this earth and heaven. To explore this, let's start with something simple and present. How do we reconcile the guy that's supposed to be in the pulpit speaking, walk it out the door, and it being empty? It's uncomfortable, right? Yeah, that, that guy should be there in the pulpit. It doesn't feel right. There should be someone there. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. This isn't natural. And to that, I say, yes, exactly. That's the point. With the empty pulpit, it's odd because we aren't used to it. We're used to having a person standing in a certain spot at 1030, well, almost 11 on Sunday mornings. But what makes the message? Is it the location? Is it the physical being? No. What makes the message is some poor fellow trying his best to glorify God and what hopefully passes is some encouragement. It's the same with us as humans. Being here on this earth, in this physical form, is what we're used to. But it isn't what makes us and really isn't natural. We really are souls that don't belong here. But this world is all we know, all we've ever known. Kind of those fish swimming in the water. And just like that empty pulpit, when things are normal and regular, we get used to it. It becomes our normal, what we expect. Now, let's flip this for a moment. Can you imagine the opposite with Jesus walking this earth? His normal, what he was used to, was heaven. This earth did not fit, did not feel normal. And every chance he got, he tried to let everyone know what he knew. Let's go to our instruction manual and take a look at one of the many times that Jesus revealed this. We are walking this earth, but we really belong to God and belong with him. Let's read from John 10, 22 through 30. John 10, 22 through 30. Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Jesus declares what he knew better than anyone else could. We have a dual nature, one of which was temporary, one of which is eternal, and where we really belong. So how do we handle this? When this world seems so normal, so much so that it's hard to see beyond it, how do we peep beyond and know really know 
that there's more than this life. How do you know that I haven't walked out the back door, hopped in the car, and headed to lunch? And this is just some recording playing for you. <laughs> you may be thinking, well, I'll just walk back there and check. But what if it wasn't that easy? When you can't see the person, or you can't see something, how do you know they are really there? Well, you can hear what I wish was a smooth, made-for-radio voice in my dreams. But that's a start, right? You can hear my voice. It comes from somewhere. Even if this is a recording, someone had to have made it, right? The very fact that there is a voice coming to the speakers means someone made it. Same with the Bible. We can hear God's voice in His Word. We have a book written over the eons that reflects a single, coherent, and incredibly beautiful message. If you see a masterpiece of art, or better yet, of architecture, there are many hands that go into the building. They are directed by an architect, a good one that makes sure the hands produce what it was intended. Now our God, He is the greatest architect. He took tools, now we're basically a ragtag group that any human architect would have run away screaming from if they had to work with them. But instead, God crafted the most wonderful story that ever saw ink meet paper. From Moses raised in fair ground, what God instructed them to, to our collection of odd fellows. It was not the Green Berets with precision coordination who wrote down God's word. But yet, Shakespeare, doing his own writing, doesn't hold a candle to the mastery and beauty found in God's word. Now, there are so many other incredible aspects to God's word. We could talk about them for a very long time. But the point is, we have God's incredible word. We can start to know God and who we are by starting there. And let's do that. Let's start back toward the beginning. Turn to Genesis 9, verses 3 through 6. Genesis 9, 3 through 6. Again, to verse 3. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it. And from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Even at the very beginning, God is telling us that we are special. There is something more to us than this flesh and bones. Now, Notice something in these verses. Now, first, there is the interesting culinary direction of if it moves, you can eat it, which is pretty interesting in and of itself. But it's true, though. We humans have found a way to make pretty much anything edible. Lobsters. For example, in reality, they're extremely poisonous, and they look like overgrown underwater bugs. But people figured out how to eat them and pay a lot of money for them. But that's a side note. What really counts is more important than that. Notice why we can't simply shoot each other when we get mad at each other. God says that we are special as we are made in His image. It's not because Larry is a nice dude that we can't shoot him. It's because Larry is made in God's image that we can't shoot him. Now, one simple fact is special enough that God puts a really high priced bounty on the head of anyone who doesn't respect it. From the very beginning, God is telling us where we should be focusing. On the eternal, on the soul, and not the body. Even though we can't find a way to eat, even when the critters crawl around the bottom of the oceans, even though we can figure that out, we can do just about anything, that isn't what really matters. That God gave us an eternal soul is what matters. So, 
We have God's word, and what it says. We're human. We want more. We can tell people things all day, but sometimes they simply need to experience it for themselves. So, by this point, you may be used to not seeing somebody in the pulpit. Assuming you haven't fallen asleep, it may be starting to get more and more normal that the pulpit is empty. But think back to the beginning and how weird it felt when the message started with no one standing there. We've established that someone or something is speaking. With God, we've established that He has spoken in the past. How do we know they're still there? How do we know that God's still there? So there's someone speaking. But how do you know I'm still here? How do you know I haven't left you? That this isn't a recording. Maybe I was here. But since you can't see me, you can't trust that I'm still here. Well, something is happening. The slides are changing. If I trip and fall as I pace around back here, you'd hear a clatter as I hit the ground. Trust me, I might do that pretty soon. But there are signs of life. Something's happening. Do we have the same with God? What are those signs of life for no mortal beating that we can't see, hear, feel, or hug? But is that statement correct? Can we see, hear, feel, or hug God? What are those signs of life for God? Now, Right now, you can't see me, but you can see what I'm doing in the slides, right? We're not on the tile slide anymore. Although we may have lingered there for a bit, we did move on. Right now, we have this lovely juggling octopus on the screen. And he's a cute fellow, but we know he's a graphic. Is it a safe bet that I haven't headed out to lunch and I'm still back here changing the slides? What about the octopus? It's a pretty good bet that I placed him there. I can tell you that, although he's moving on the screen, he didn't walk on there all by himself. Now, I could have pre-recorded the slides and voice. Sure. But that's a lot of work. Wouldn't it be easier and simpler for me to simply change the slides and speak in real time? It's very similar. But much, much more grand and much more incredible with God. We say that, see the days tick by. The stars at night, the weather, the mountains, the majesty of his creations. We read his word and can hear his voice. We feel the warmth of the sun, the cool of the rain, the push of the wind. We hug and are hugged by his creations. Then we call our family and he calls us his family. For those of us with children, try hugging one of them and see if you don't feel the warmth of the other person who helped make them. Now, I don't advise this next experiment until after the surge in COVID passes, so please do not do this experiment today. But in the future, when we can, try hugging another one of God's children and see if you don't feel the warmth of God's love when you do. God continuously gives us signs of life in every direction. We simply need to be willing to be open to it. That's the reason we had the scripture reading from this morning. It's a beautiful set of verses from Psalms. Psalm 19, 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Every single thing and every single person declares the glory of God if we're willing to look for it. So even though you all can't see me, we've established that there are signs of life going on. With God, the signs are majestic and beautiful. My signs pale in comparison. Well, so what? Someone's back there. Why does that matter, Hill of Beans? Who cares if some dude is stumbling around in the back room talking and showing slides of little animated critters? Why does that matter? What would make it matter? 
What if I told you, I love you? I do. I love this church family. You all mean a lot to me. And not just the folks on the lines that I call mom and dad either. Me and my family came here from thousands of miles away, other side of the continent. And you all took us in. You made us part of your family. And that means a lot. Now, does me saying that change anything for you? Some may say, meh, I guess we'll put up with that crazy guy. But for others, if you return the sentiment, does it change anything? Does it make it a bit easier for you to go, for you to put up with the discomfort of a weird message like this? Does it help you make it through to the end a little bit easier? And don't worry, we're almost all at the done. The end is close. But think about why God wrote to us the love letter of the Bible that he gave to us. It makes it a bit easier to put up with the discomfort of being in this world where we don't really belong. It makes it a bit easier to make it to the finish line. We can be assured that God is here, and he will never leave us. This is one of the reasons that Romans 8 is one of my favorites. In the first part, it reminds us of who we are, that we are of the Spirit, that we are God's children, and that nothing can separate us from his love. Romans 8, especially the end, can read like a victory speech. Let's try that. Romans 8, 37 through 39. Romans 8, 37 through 39. Get in verse 37. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing separates us from God. As long as we have our God, we will make it through whatever this life brings our way. Notice how one of the terms listed is life. Even though God is spirit, and we are spirits, subjected to this mortal realm, not even this life can separate us from God. All the way, across the distance from the spiritual to the physical, God has found so many ways to let us know that He is here, with us, always. An unlimited God does not let anything keep us away from Him. The only thing that can keep us from God is us. We can can turn away. We can do that. Why in the world would we? Life with God is good. Romans 8 not only reminds us who we are, it reminds us that God is in our corner. God's Spirit makes intercessions for us. We can only groan. We can't find the words. Don't know what to say. So, in conclusion, always remember that there's more to life. There's more to us than this life. This life here is temporary. Separation from God, from where we belong. So don't get so used to this world that we think this is all there is. You miss the signs that points to eternity. We are souls, temporary locked in these bodies. The eternity in God gave us these souls. And that's where our focus should always be. Even though we let this life become where we think we're used to, remember to listen to God's voice. Look for those signs of God in your life and all around you. And be confident that God is here with us. He loves us. And if, even if we can't see him directly, he's there. So, if you have not joined God's family and committed your soul to God, now, honestly, any time, is a good time to sign up to be part of God's family. Or almost a quick dip in the water. If you'd like to be baptized, or is there anything that you need, 
in the congregation, please let know as we stand and we sing the invitation song.